and now it is. I have a really light time. <laughs> I have a very big mouth. Okay. All right. So today we're talking about doing a cardiac assessment and we're talking about doing a respiratory assessment. So that's what you're going to practice on your partner. Okay. So let's talk about cardiac first. What do you want to hear when you uh, do a cardiac assessment? Love dose. Love dose. Love dose. Love dose. And is that regular or irregular? Regular. Okay. And what could it be if it's irregular? An arrhythmia? No. 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 <laughs> If you're listening for love dub, love dub, love dub, and it goes love dub, love, love dub, love dub, love, 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 love then what kind of rhythm could the patient be in? Atrial fib. Atrial fibrillation, okay? Where what happens in atrial fibrillation is the top part of the heart just quivers, and then the bottom half of the heart, the ventricles, um, pump, right? So you're going to, um, well your valves are still going to open and close, but you're going to have a, a very erratic rhythm, okay? It's going to be very, very irregular. Hey guys, if you're in the neural, can you guys move down and, and kind of keep it quiet for us? Okay, so we're starting up here. Okay, so if you have atrial fib, um, what happens to somebody in atrial fib? What are we worried about? Uh, blood pooling and clotting. Yep, blood pooling and clotting because that atrium's not contracting well. It's just quivering, so the blood is going to sit in there and pool and clots. And so where is your clot going to go when you go back into a nice sinus rhythm? Into one of the ventricles? Where into one side of your, into the right side of your lung, I mean into the right side of your heart, where's the blood, where's that blood go to? The lung, so it's a... Pulmonary embolism. And the left side of your heart? Then it would be in the aortic, it would be like an aortic aneurysm maybe? Or? No, an aneurysm is a weakening of the lung, right. yeah. but if it goes up, yes. So you could have a stroke and you could have a pulmonary embolus, okay? So that's why we anticoagulate somebody who's in atrial fib. So if you're listening and you're doing an assessment and it's been documented that it's a regular rhythm and all of a sudden it's irregular that you're hearing, you want to let your co-assigned nurse know that. They may want to do a 12 lead EKG and look at what's going on with that heart that's different. Because if somebody flips into atrial fib and they can do it with, at any time without any warning, then it, it could be problematic for your patient. Okay? Can we hear this? Can we determine just by the stethoscope which side? Or that has to be done with the EKG? You can't, you have to, you can't determine atrial fib by listening. You can suspect it, but you can't confirm it. Confirming it is by 12 lead EKG or rhythm strips, telemetry, you can confirm it with that. But you can't confirm, the only way that you could confirm whether somebody had clots in the top part of their heart would be an echocardiogram there, looking at um, the hearts and the, I don't know if you do it with an MRI, but um, I know it's an echocardiogram is what we do it with. And we look to see if there's clots in there. Okay. So um, that atrial fib, so that's what you really want to focus on when you're listening to a heart. You want to make sure that it's a regular rhythm, okay? And if it's irregular, you're going to let somebody know. If your patient has a history of atrial fib all the time, then it's going to be irregular when you listen to it. Okay, so now we're going to listen to the valves. So where are we listening to the valves? The sternal border, second and fourth intercostal spaces, and then the intra, the, the mid clavicular line. And, oh, okay. What's the first valve we're going to listen to? Tricuspid. Okay. Second intercostal space on the right side. Okay. What's the next one? Pulmonic. Pulmonic. Okay. On the left, directly across from the aorta, you have your pulmonic. Okay. Does that make sense when you think of how the heart? how the heart is pictured. Both of those vessels come out. Okay, and then where else? Tricuspid. Tricuspid. Yeah. And then mitral. Okay. How do you remember that? All points to monitor. All points to monitor is one way, and one that they just said this morning, I thought was great, it's easy to remember. All patients take this. Ape to man. Ape to man. So all, all patients take meds. That's a very good one for nursing students to remember, probably. Ape to man. Yep. Nancy, do you do the medical one? All no, physicians earn tons of money. All physicians, all physicians earn tons of money. Earn tons. All physicians earn tons of money. 
Eight to man. What does the E stand for? Eight. Herbs point. Oh, herbs point. Yeah. Herbs point. Okay. That's third, right? Third. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we really. So we're basically we're talking about we're going to listen to those valves. Okay. And then we're going to do what else when we do our cardiac assessment? Yep, you want to look at all the pulses, okay? So where are all the pulses that you're going to look at? Find them on yourself. Temporal is one, right? Temporal, carotid. Now the carotids, do you ever massage the carotids? No. Okay, why don't you massage them? Because you might mobilize a plaque or something. They could have plaque. And plaque starts at a very young age now, so um, if you dislodge plaque, then where does it go? The brain. The brain, and you have a stroke, okay? Okay, so it's easy to find your carotids. You just slide along the trachea and to the side. Just slide right along the trachea, and you'll find it right on the side. Everybody find the carotid? Mm -hmm. Okay, easy enough. Okay, and you should have one on each side. It should be bilateral. When you look at pulses, everything you want is bilateral, and you want them to be the same. You want them to be the same strength, okay? Because if they're not, then that could be a problem. Okay, so what else do we want to look at? The axillary one? What other pulses? Radial. 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 Ulnar. Radial. Radial. Okay. Now how do you know, um, have you ever heard of an Allen's test? Okay. All right, so you're going to have to put your books down, grab your partner. <laughs> Does everybody have a partner? I think there's an odd number of people, so we're like a triad. Yeah. That's okay, cool. who's odd? Okay. Um, the three of us, yeah. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> I think. No. Oh, yeah. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Patrick got Dan out, okay, everybody? Okay, so basically, and I'll, and I'll show you on Patrick, okay? So what you want to do is you want to grab both the radial and the ulnar arteries, and you want to put pressure on both of those. You want them to open their hand and close their hand three times. Now look at the hand, and you see how pale it is? Enough to block the pulses, okay? You see how it's very pale? Then you release the ulnar artery only. Ooh, that felt weird. Okay, now what should happen is you should see a nice pink return to the hand right away, right? You see the pink return to the hand right away? Everybody see that? If you are radial dominant, meaning oh, yeah, like a if you, there 10% of the population is called radial dominant, okay? That means that their radial artery is the primary source <laughs> of blood supply to their hand. Okay? So what do you think will happen if you let go of the ulnar artery and you keep the radial? It won't change color. It'll stay very pale or it'll change very, very slowly. So why would we want to do this test? Sort of like a capillary refill test almost, but it's the whole hand, not just the capillaries, right? But why would we want to do it? Well, if we were to draw a blood gas, okay? If they if they drew a radial blood gas, you need to draw do this test before they draw a radial blood gas. Okay? Because if they puncture that artery, cause a big hematoma, then that person's lost blood supply to the so this is called an Allen's test. It's a good test to see if how their um, their hand is getting um, arterial blood supply. Just think of just doing it on was not dominant. No, they wouldn't do it on that hand at all. Oh, okay. Right, they wouldn't do it on that hand. They'd go to the other arm, but oh, it wouldn't be the same. It might not be the same on either. Um, it might not be the same. But you would do this what's called an Allen's test. So go ahead and do it on each other. Alright, hold close your hand three times. <laughs> so, we do this to determine what? Uh, which we do it to determine whether you're taking an arterial blood gas from that or is a good idea. Oh, so, so they would take it from my owner? No, no, no. They just want to make sure that they're going to try to do the radial. If they blow the radial, they need to make sure that it circulates. 
Uh, uh, if you have poor circulation to the owner and they blow your radio, yeah. then you have no circulation to your radio. Gotcha. No, 10% are the population. Look at your two thumbs are the size of mine. Ready? Wow, look okay. at So, mine did change. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. One base. It's kind of all washed off. Washed off. So when, you, when it, your hand turns pink, when you let go of the ulnar, that means you have both, both arteries are supplying blood to your hand. 10% of the population do not have, the ulnar does not let the hand turn pink. Okay, so it doesn't, it's a very slow um, change to pink. Okay, but you saw how quickly your hand changes. Okay. So that's um, and the Allen's test. Okay, what else do we want to look at? We're still looking at pulses. So what are the pulses in our arms? Can we talk about those? Radial. Radial. If I have radial pulses, do I have brachial pulses? Yes. 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 Okay, now what about the legs? Uh, uh, popliteal. Popliteal. Femoral. Don't forget your femoral. I said it. <laughs> so don't forget your femoral pulses. Okay. Your popliteal, that is the hardest pulse to find. Okay. It is the hardest pulse to find. It's not a real strong pulse. It's very, and it's it's a very hard pulse to find. But you're going to find it today, any You'll be digging, but you'll be fine. <laughs> okay, what's the next one below that? Fetal. Posterior tibial, tibial and your dorsalis pedis or pedal pulses as we call them. Okay, so if you have, um, if you can't feel pedal pulses, what do you do? Doppler. Doppler. Okay, what if your Doppler's broken? And take the tibial one. Your stethoscope will How about tell your capillaries? You can oh, yeah, set the capillary fill, but what piece of equipment can you use on your um, Oh, the, uh, the the pulse oximeter. Yeah, right. yeah. Pulse oximeter. Oh, really? Your pulse oximeter is is on is when you see the waveform and you see the bar go up and down yeah. on the pulse oximeter. That's because it's found a pulse, and that's how it's checking the O2 saturation. Okay, so that's all it does is doing. So if you want to know for a quick way, you can put your pulse oximeter on your toe and find out if you've got pulses in your feet. Okay, um, and that's just a quick way of doing it. You really want to get the Doppler and make sure you can hear it, but it is a, a way that you can figure it out. Like if somebody has a fem pop bypass, what we used to do. Um, in the recovery room years ago is we would just put the pulse oximeter probe on the toe and we would be monitoring continuously and we could see if somebody was plotting off their graph because the pulse ox would get a smaller and smaller wave tracing, you know, um, and that's what you're looking for. So you're, you really want to see a nice brisk wave tracing and your pulse ox should be the same on your finger as it does on your toes. You know, your body doesn't discriminate and give more to your hands than it does to your feet. Okay. okay, so anyway, we're, um, so we can check with that. What happens if somebody were bleeding out, what would happen to their pulse oximeter? It would go down. Down? Why would it go down? What is, what is pulse oximetry? It's monitoring the oxygen. It's, it's transluminating. It's monitoring a percent. The percent of red blood cells that are oxygenated, right? That an oxygen hooks on to, okay? So it's a percent of um, red blood cells that are oxygenated. So if you have less blood, red blood cells in your body, what will happen to your pulse oximeter? Would, would, would it go up because it's mobilizing more percent, like it per unit of blood? It will go up because yeah. there's less red cells. You have the same amount of oxygen coming in, but you have less red cells to hook on to. So it's going to hook on to 100% of them. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And then have some left over, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, and have some yeah. left over that, that aren't going to be on any of them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I get it. So that's yeah. good. 
yeah, and you're thinking, oh, it's 100 percent, but it's great. But it isn't great because it's um, your patient could have um, a bleeding problem that you don't realize or don't know. So if you've got somebody who's and you look back in their vital signs and you see them coming up to 100 percent, but they don't look like a 100 percent person when you do your assessment and stuff, you really want to make sure that you know you look at what their crit is doing. You know, if their crit's headed down, they might be to a, a much more critical level of that. H&H. Um, &H. Does that make sense? Nursing makes sense. Just think about these things. They make sense. Okay. So you're going to um, check all your pulses, okay? And you're going to listen to the heart. Okay. Then let's talk about respiratory. What are we going to do with respiratory? We're going to listen to like a group of, uh, what is it, like 12, 10, 3, 3. On the back. Three on one side. What do you want to start yeah. with, though? When you walk into the room, what is your first thing that you want to look at? Skin color. 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 The breathing. Color. How are they breathing? Are they are they labored? Are they having trouble? Are you are they using all their accessory muscles? You guys want to come up here so you're not talking looking at my back. But are they using all their accessory muscles? Is there are they breathing? nice and calmly and are they hyperventilating what are they doing okay so the, the minute you walk into the patient room you can figure out what's going on with your patient if you know one of their abc's is a little bit amiss usually by how they're breathing okay at least your airway and breathing so you really want to be able to just kind of walk into the room and look at them do they look nice and relaxed are they panicked? Are they short of breath? Are they having trouble? Um, are they gurgling and, and full of secretions? Okay, because that's going to change your priorities when you see those things. Okay. Okay, so you're going to go into the room. You're going to look at the patient. You're going to ask him how he's breathing. Okay. What else are you going to then do? For a respiratory assessment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking to my and also by watching. So what does B E C E mean? Bilateral equal chest expansion. Chest expansion. Okay. So bilateral equal chest expansion. So as a student, you should be documenting B E C E. Okay. Because you're going to test for bilateral equal chest expansion. And how do we test that? Manually. <laughs> Okay, so let me show you. Okay. <laughs> Dance. On the back. Thumbs on the back. I don't know if you're Thumbs on the back. Okay. And then take a deep breath. You see the difference in the, the thumbs, they move apart. Okay, and you're you're basically cupping the sides of your chest. You can feel that equal expansion. Okay. So that's a B E C D. Okay, what else are you going to check on? Where do you put the thumbs? Because I think I just put them a little higher than you do. Yeah, I think the bases. Yeah, I don't think I did them that well. Not that I should take time. Oh, yeah, they separate. Okay. Okay. Because if it's too high, they're not going to separate. If they're um, too low, they're going to separate. And then you're at the waistline. Okay. All right. So we want to do that. What's the other thing we want to do while we're back there? Maybe percuss a little bit. We want to feel. You want to be able to feel. Oh, the, the vibration. Any, yeah. You want to first feel and make sure there's no lumps and bumps or anything. Um, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago who um, I was doing a physical exam on, and she just had open heart surgery and. I get this, I turn her over and she's got this big lump on the back of her back and it's coming out of her back chest. And um, so I said something to the PA, he goes, yeah, we haven't told her yet, but we think she has lung cancer. And he said, that's a nice big, um, huge tumor in her, in her lung that's putting so much pressure. Oh, okay. So, you know, so if your assessment is, is what you're going to really focus on, you can really pick up a lot of things. Okay, so what you want to do when you do fremitus, you want your hands flat on the person's back and say 99. All the way down. What you're going to feel is a vibration, okay? What happens when you don't feel a vibration? There's no more lungs. Hey, there's no more lungs. <laughs> or there could be an infiltrate pneumonia, okay? Because it will not vibrate through there. 
Uh, okay, so that's a very important part um, of your um, assessment, especially if you've got somebody with pneumonia. Okay, you've got a patient with pneumonia, that's a key indication, and you can figure out where that pneumonia is by doing that, as well as you can see if their pneumonia is getting better after you put your plan of care. Okay, you've got, then we're going to listen to breath sounds anteriorly and posteriorly, and um. What, ha what do we hear when we hear breath sound? I guess it depends on where we're listening. We're listening to bilateral breath sounds. Uh, what are some of the bad breath sounds we listen for? Like rails, rails, crackles. Rails, crackles. rails used to be called rails, now they're called crackles. So what are crackles? Sounds like your hair. Snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies. Okay, and it's air going through fluid, going through water. So, what types of patients would you find Excuse crackles me. in? Excuse pneumonia. Uh, you got to go around next time, okay? Thank you. Okay, so which, which, um, what types of patients? Like lower lobe infections. Have crackles. Oh, uh, flash pulmonary edema, CHF, that kind of thing. CHF. -er. Yeah. Okay. So if your patient has a history of CHF, chances are they're going to have crackles in their face. Okay. Because they, people don't get rid of those completely usually. Okay. Or if you've got somebody who's just got newly diagnosed, had a big MI, and you know their lungs are filling up, so they will have crackles. All right. And that is simply that water bubbling through air. Okay. What are ronchi? <laughs> fluid, it's not really fluid, it's mucus. Yeah. Okay. So it's a thick mucus. And so what does it sound like? It sounds like a freaking open. Um, yep, you can hear it sound of snoring. It's a much harsher sounding noise than crackles. Crackles are a, a very, for the most part, what you're going to be hearing unless you're working in an ICU, you'll probably hear pretty fine crackles, you know, and so they're they're very, they're not real disturbing to you, you know, but ronchi are far more disturbing to you because they're a lot louder, they're a lot, um, and they can be scattered all around. Okay, which one would clear with coughing? Ronchi. Ronchi would clear with coughing. So you can listen to why, why it's so important to do your assessment when you first come in to see your patient is because then you establish a baseline. This is what my patient is at 7 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 when you get to do that assessment. And at 11.30, before you go to lunch, you can listen to breath sounds again and say, geez, my plan of care worked. So what does your plan of care um, include with somebody with a lot of rock type? Cut to a deep breath. Maybe. Position, get them out of bed, walking them. Postural drainage, maybe? Yep, you need, I think you need an order for that. In most, oh, okay. Most hospitals, but yes. Um, so you really need to, you know, work on them respiratory-wise. All right, you've got somebody, you're listening to breast sounds, they're decreased in the basis. So what's, um, what is somebody, who would you suspect that in? COPD. Um, COPD is probably going to be diminished throughout. Oh, throughout, we'll okay. Through that in a okay. What would you, ex what kind of patient do you expect? Pneumonia. Who doesn't like to take deep breaths? Kristen? Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Right, and you can't because your belly is big, okay? So what other patients have big bellies? The obese. People have abdominal surgeries. Abdominal surgeries. All right, what other conditions? Ascites. Ascites is another good one. Okay, so those are the patients that when you go in, it will not be surprising to you to see decreased breast sounds in the bases because of their um, condition, okay? Which doesn't mean that they can't do it, it's just means that you're going to have to work extra hard to get them to do it and help position them right so gravity pulls everything down, okay? Gravity is a great thing um, because it just pulls everything down. That's why your crackles stay in your basis because of gravity. When you listen to lungs, both anterior and posteriorly, if your patient's laying in the bed like this, what's going to sound clear? Anteriorly is going to sound clear. Posteriorly, they may sound like a totally different patient. You're going like, wow. 
how, what happened. But when you turn them and then listen posteriorly, you'll hear. You'll be able to hear more. Okay. So you want to listen both anteriorly and posteriorly to your lungs, and um, you want to figure out what's going on in those lungs and put it together with the picture that you have of your patient. Okay. What does their past medical history include? Are they um, CHF? Do they have a poor ejection fraction, which means the ability of the heart to pump blood out? Um, and um, what kind of disease processes do they have? Now you take a COPD, what happens to a COPD patient? What happens, what do you see in their lung assessment? Diminished breath sounds. Diminished breath sounds, why? No, because they have a barrel chest, okay? They lost their ability to expand and retract, okay? Their lungs are kind of always inflated. So you don't have that in and out, and so your breast sounds are a lot more diminished. Plus, they've got this barrel-sized chest, which makes it harder to hear. <laughs> so those are your, um, some of the more common things that you're going to see in a respiratory assessment. So your plan of care for those people with decreased breast sounds and scattered ronchi are going to be that incentospirometry, deep breathing, coughing, getting out of bed, walking, moving them, getting them really, you know, up in a chair if that's all they can go, okay? Sitting them upright in the bed, okay? With rails, crackles, what are you going to, what's your plan of care probably going to include? Well, you cough, turn, and deep breathe, and... Well, you're going to do that for everybody, but with crackles, what, what do you think? What kind of medications are you going to be getting? Oh, okay. Like diuretics, okay? So you're going to put that together. If somebody comes in and you see their list of meds, they're on Lasix, then you're going to pretty much assume that they're on Lasix probably because they have congestive heart failure and they need to dump that fluid out, okay? So that's the type of thing that you're going to be looking at now is putting that whole picture together and being able to come up with a plan of care that's going to work on that patient, okay? So when you have wheezing, somebody with asthma, what are you going to hear? Musical pitch. Wheezes, okay? Yeah, you're going to hear it. Why do you hear it? Because, because the passageway is narrowed. And like when you whistle, you're just blowing air through a constricted area. The same thing happens in your lungs, so you wheeze. Okay, that's all wheezing is. When you have an asthmatic patient and you don't hear any breath sounds at all, you're in a lot deeper trouble than if you hear wheezing. You'd rather hear wheezing on an asthmatic than no breath sounds at all because that means they're not moving any air. You know, time's running out. So, um, wheezing is good. You're going to get give them something. What would you give them? Like a duoneb or a buterol or? Yep, one of the neb treatments. You would give them one of the neb treatments to open up those airways and stop that wheezing, okay? And so you want to check their lungs before they give them the treatment and then after the treatment. Did it make a difference? Did it do anything? Okay. All right, so any questions on, on that stuff? So that's what you're going to practice on each other now. You have a check-off sheet for me to sign for both cardiac and respiratory. So um, if you guys want to start practicing on each other, make sure you find those popliteal pulses. <coughs> i got to get my... What's uh, uh, school? All right, I feel super right. having to ask this, but what's ascites? What's what? Ascites? Ascites, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when their third space fills with fluid. Oh, oh okay, all right. <laughs>